Um, so welcome uh, to uh, Delivery Exception here. Uh, this is a speaker series that we've organized uh, for this spring, bringing together scholars and organizers to discuss logistical justice and to examine the possibilities of reconciliation in an era of supply chain capitalism. Uh, this event uh, is free and open to the public, but we do have uh, some credits there that I have to acknowledge. Um, it's organized as part of the Supply Studies Research Network, a group of scholars, students, activists, and organizers who identified their active interest in the critical study of logistics. And the research network itself is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities Office of the Digital Humanities. Funding and additional support for this series is provided by the Conference of Arts and Science Deans and the Department of Communication and Media Studies here at Fordham. And while as a virtual event, the geographies that have been enrolled in our gathering here today are many, I'd like to acknowledge that Fordham itself occupies the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape and Wappinger peoples. Uh, before I introduce our uh, speakers for today, I just want to give a shout out to our upcoming events. Our next event is Monday, March 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, with Miriam Posner uh, from uh, UCLA. And then on Wednesday, March 27th at 6 p.m., we have our last event of this series uh, with Benjamin McKean uh, from Ohio State University, uh, Jessica Champagne from Worker uh, Rights um, Consortium, and Angela Solis from Make the Road Action. Uh, our speakers today, I'll go ahead and introduce them, but feel free, uh, Christina and Athena, to say say a little bit more about yourself. Um, uh, Christina Dunbar-Hester uh, is a researcher and writer whose work focuses on democratic control of technologies. She's the author of Oil Beach, which I have right here, How Toxic Infrastructure Threatens Life in the Ports of Los Angeles and Beyond, uh, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2023. Uh, Hacking Diversity, The Politics of Inclusion in Open Technology Cultures, uh, which was published in 2020, and which I do have back there somewhere, but I didn't prep it for, uh, for this event. And Low Power to the People, Pirates, Protest, and Politics and FM Radio Activism. She holds a PhD in Science and Technology Studies from Cornell University, and she is a faculty member in the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication. Our other speaker today is Athena Tan from Plugin IE. Uh, Athena Tan is the Research and Policy Coordinator for Plugin IE, a labor and environmental justice project of the Inland Empire Labor Institute in Southern California. She received a PhD in Film and Media Studies from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So welcome to you both. Uh, I think that we're going to uh, hand it off, at least initially, to uh, our two uh, speakers, and they're going to share uh, some initial thoughts about their work and uh, some of the issues that we're discussing today, uh, and then maybe we'll move into a, a slightly more open uh, conversation. Uh, if at any point uh, anyone has questions, uh, there's a little Q&A button, which you can use to produce that question, uh, or you can type it in the chat. Um, if there's time towards the end or at sort of natural points in the conversation, uh, I'll ask if people want to verbalize their questions with their microphone, and then you can raise your hand, and I'll give you Zoom permission to go ahead and speak to us. But you're always welcome to use the chat, and you're always welcome to put things into that Q&A. Uh, so uh, I think I'll begin by handing it off to Christina. Okay, hi. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you very much to Matt for the invitation and the warm welcome and the nice calming broadcaster style uh, fade into the event. Um, thank you also to uh, Athena, uh, who I'm really delighted to be in conversation with, uh, and to everyone in the audience today. Um, I'm not literally speaking to you from the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, but I thought it would be good to symbolically emplace myself where the land and the water meet, uh, 
for a minute. Um, and I'm gonna do a quick visual overview of the site uh, because I think that it will help inform and enliven our conversation if you can just see uh, what it is I'm talking about a little bit. So now calling up slides. Um, but of course I did not begin at the beginning. How embarrassing for me. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so this is a, you know, literal overview, uh, an aerial view of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, um, which are together, they're, they're contiguous, they're administered separately by the two cities, um, but together they're one of the top 10 com container ports in the world. Uh, so a very, very massive site um, physically and also, you know, very, very important for, you know, economic reasons and um, sort of world infrastructural systems. Um, and also, since I know not everyone's intimately familiar with California or the California coastline, I just want to point out they're like in this little bay called San Pedro Bay, not about 20 miles south of Los Angeles. And this is the area uh, before all this infill and dredging and modernist transformation occurred. This is slightly inland also in uh, an area in Long Beach or surrounded by Long Beach um, where oil was identified in the 1920s. So the ports were placed here in the very, very early 1900s before oil was identified, but soon the area grew into um, not only handling you know, container or commodities of various kinds, later containers, uh, but really important for petroleum handling and, and refining. Um, and so in the post-war post period uh, also gets, you know, connected to um, the interstate highway system and the, you know, building out of, of freeways for freight movement, which is a um, sort of foreshadowing of, of what Athena will be talking about. Uh, so this is a 1964 press photo from the port of Long Beach showing all the freeways. This is the petroleum handling now and container handling uh, and petro petroleum refining uh, in, in the ports in the present. This is a port of LA press photo showing all of the containers and how shiny and pretty and colorful they look. Uh, this is another port of LA press photo showing a blue whale, which is the largest mammal on earth, just a little hint of it above the water. Uh, and you can see all the container cranes in, in the background. Uh, and this is, again, it's, it's port PR. These look much cleaner and shinier and sort of more salubrious than maybe that image. Um, and so I want to sort of hold, hold that in mind. Uh, even cleaner, cleaner and shinier and, and more sort of frictionless is this just-in-time shipping press photo, which shows all these uh, intermodal uh, transport options. You know, we see trucks, we see the container ship, we see cranes, we see the road, and of course we see air freight. Um, so this very spectacular kind of high modernist, uh, seamless uh, space of, you know, flowing goods. Um, in reality, however, of course, we are in intensifying heat waves, flooding, et cetera, uh, everywhere. And the air here, which is, um, as people may know, California has uh, strict air regulations, which it is never, ever, ever in compliance with. And locally, this affects uh, residents around the port and in the freight corridors. Uh, and it's also heating up. And the port's um, having leaned into scale in about 1970 are further leaning into scale. And they just built this huge new bridge to accommodate even more movement of goods and bigger ships. Um, this is an image to maybe think with uh, a restored wetlands in Long Beach, which is also a site of, um, was the site of oil extraction before being restored. And you can also see infrastructure humming. Uh, this is the LA River right here and electrical uh, infrastructure. So that's really about it from me. I just wanted to, again, give an overview of the place. Uh, that's the book, Matt already held it up. Uh, as both our world and confrontation with fossil fuel heat up, literally and metaphorically, 
the site of extraordinary damage is, I think, a really good one to think with about just futures for energy and for supply chains. I'm not sure uh, about taking the coastal region's official pledges to clean up their act uh, at base value, but we also don't want to see, um, you know, we also don't want to see the harms that uh, are are visited upon residents, human and otherwise, here just pushed elsewhere into sacrifice zones. Uh, and here's where I'll hand off to Athena, who's working on supply chain justice in situ in the distribution zone inland, uh, which is where imported goods go immediately after they make landfall at the ports. Uh, and if you're in North America, as probably many of you are, there's a good chance that you're actually within arm's reach of the goods, uh, of some goods that transited through this site. And so I just wanted to sort of surround all of us uh, visually and artifactually uh, with thinking with the site and its effects. And here I will mute myself and hand off and stop sharing. Thanks. Hi, thanks, Christina. Um, thanks for inviting me to be on here. And thanks to Matt for organizing and hosting this. Um, Christina and I did not coordinate our Zoom backgrounds, but as you can see, I had the same idea of um, placing myself in the region. So behind me um, is a photo taken by local photographer, Freddy Calderon um, of San Bernardino of a warehouse in the Inland Empire region which I'm going to switch over to a map now. Let's see. So last year, um, researchers and environmental justice advocates out of the Inland Empire and out of um, Pitzer College of the Claremont Colleges came out with this really great resource called Warehouse City. I don't think there's a way to make it full screen, but let's see, there's a zoom laser pointer type thing, right? Just that's that's beyond my zoom knowledge. I don't know. Okay, no, I don't think there is. Um is my is my mouse pointer showing up though? We can yeah. see your cursor, yeah. Okay, yep. <laughs> sorry. Um, so Christina has been focusing on the port area over here that's to the south of LA. And the Inland Empire um, is what you reach um, just from a goods movement perspective. Trucks make their way up the 710 freeway and then onto these arteries inland, um, 60 freeway, the 10 freeway primarily. And this is the Inland Empire, where you see this density of warehouses, especially around Ontario Airport. Um, and sorry, got to backtrack. So I work with Plugin IE, um, which is a labor and environmental justice project, as Matt mentioned from my bio of the Inland Empire Labor Institute, which in turn is the AFL-CIO, um, is the nonprofit weighing of the AFL-CIO affiliate in our region, the Inland Empire Labor Council. And our project originated with a 2019 campaign around um, warehouse development in the region when it became um, public that the San Bernardino Airport, which is a redevelopment zone that used to be an Air Force base, um, where my mouse pointer is, was going to develop a large um, regional logistics air hub. And everyone knew that it was going to be an Amazon air hub, although that wasn't publicly stated. And so many organizations came together um, Teamsters Local 1932 out of San Bernardino, the Inland Empire Labor Council, uh, Inland Congregations United for Change. Um, at that point, the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, the Sierra Club. So 
many different um, stakeholders in the region representing residents, representing environmental justice issues, representing workers um, to demand a community benefits agreement. And I'm not from the region. At the time I had lived here for a few months, I heard about this organizing and got involved as a volunteer. Um, the campaign wasn't successful in terms of securing a CBA, but it was extremely generative for organizing and um, just visioning a different future for this region, which is to switch visuals now. Um, let's see. So, starting in the 1980s, the Southern California um, Association of Governments had planned out this whole region as a logistics hub to build up business around the ports of LA and Long Beach. Um, as a mode of economic recovery, as Cold War um, weapons manufacturing and related industries were declining in the LA area. And warehouse construction really exploded around the 2000s um, and has continued to do so since, as you saw in the other map. So there's been um, a lot of bottom-up pushback against these top-down plans for the region. Um, and my project was devised as an intervention in the workforce development space um, with the idea that we could uphold high job standards for warehouse work um, and trucking work other jobs in logistics, while also promoting um, air quality mitigation measures that would sort of create model employers in logistics that could be held up as alternatives to the Amazons and the Walmarts. Um, sorry, I feel like this is all over the place. So maybe I'll leave it off there for now. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, uh, so um, maybe uh, maybe I can ask a kind of guiding question here, um, which is, you know, I mean, it, it's obvious that there's this, this relationship between both of your projects, right? But, you know, your work. Um, but there's also, you know, I guess, a difference like every time i always i'm always like what you know inland empire i don't live in california i know what the inland empire is abstractly i suppose i've never lived in california so to me it's this kind of like vague spot on the map um and every time i you know inland empire i just want to see the the borders of the map i like thinking in maps and it's always weird to me that it like doesn't go to the port like on wikipedia it's like separate from the port it's this sort of explosion like overflow from this you know obviously where all these things are coming in to go to all the warehouses and uh you know thinking about oil beach you know oil beach is very much focused on the ports right um i would say that that is you know that's where we begin in oil beach you know that's the sort of you know, uh, kind of evocative entry point. And I would imagine, and you know, both of you feel free to correct me. I would imagine, Athena, that, you know, a lot of your work is focused on, you know, the the warehouses, right? The inland part of this story. And I guess I'm curious to start with, you know, how do both of you see these places connected? Because of course they're connected, but how do you see them connected in your own work, in the way you've approached, you know, what is, obviously part of a gargantuan world system, right? You know, this problem of the supply chain, this, you know, question of logistical justice that our, you know, series is interested in. But, you know, Athena, do you think about the port a lot? Do you organize, you know, are you, uh, you know, thinking of Teamsters, you know, is it 
are warehouse workers and port workers connected in your mind in this quite intimate way? And the same thing, you know, to, for Christina, do you think about, you know, because a lot of Oil Beach, if anyone in attendance has not read Oil Beach, you should definitely read it. It's a great book, you know, is is interested in, you know, the environment, non-humans, right, often centered around the port. You know, we have marine animals and, you know, uh, marine birds and things like that. Um, so how do you see the relationship of that environment, of those species, you know, as we move farther inland? Or is that something that, you know, you didn't didn't quite get to, but are are interested in? This is just sort of a kind of general connection, you know, question to think about this connection. I can, I can start, Please. although I feel like that was maybe five different questions, but. <laughs> That's all my questions um, are, too many questions, sorry. <laughs> One thing I can start with is, yeah, I'm glad you talked about um, kind of the way that things extend from the port to inland because Christina and I were talking the other day about the phrase inland port, which is sometimes used. And the idea that port doesn't end at the port, it actually is just this very large port corridor that goes very far inland. And I think actually going back to that map, I'm just going to pull it up again. Um, and zooming way out, at this point, we're seeing the development of an inland port all the way up here in Barstow, which is a hub between Southern California and Las Vegas. Um, it's a big BNSF rail hub. So they want to build out more warehouses up there for goods that are being shipped by rail. And, you know, the word inland port is literally being used. So we're looking at this very long corridor extending, um, I don't know, well over a hundred miles inland. And in my work, we are not thinking of the port from day to day, but we definitely inherited the legacy of the port truck drivers and environmental justice campaign of the 2000s. Um, I would say that was the direct precursor of the work we're doing where um, residents around Wilmington and Long Beach came together to demand that um, the port and the city take measures to reduce the diesel emissions coming from trucks just waiting to unload and load goods at the port. Um, and at the same time, labor organizers saw the opportunity to change the situation by which trucking, the deregulation of the trucking industry had made so many drayage operators, and drayage refers to those who carry goods into and out of the port, um, were classified, misclassified as independent contractors. So in trying to address the environmental issues around the port, it's like you were asking people who were not technically employees to shoulder the costs of upgrading the technology of their trucks um, to lessen emissions. And so the idea with that campaign was could you say that on the one hand, trucking technology had to be updated to reduce emissions, and at the same time, truckers had to be taken on as employees, classified correctly, um, so that those costs could be borne by these major logistics carriers running drayage operations? So yeah, that's the legacy of our project. So I can try to, um, thank you, Athena, talk a little bit about how these sites, I think, are really, really connected. And my book is about the coastal area, but, um, you know, one of the things that's going on and, you know, showing the, the image of um, the restored wetlands, you know, I don't want us to sort of, again, take that at face value as some kind of like, Edenic past being, you know, re uh, revitalized or something. Um, but some of what's going on, I think, is is the coastal area is, you know, being reclaimed for 
recreation and uh you know residential use not all of it you know the corridors that connect to the inland empire are are definitely uh you know that commitment runs very deep on the part of of regional officials and the state um but there is a um a push to green the port and and produce pr that represents a, a greener more more livable port and i will actually share again for a second too because i left out one slide before um uh and this is port of long beach pr from 2019 i think they designated the port the green port in around 2004 i think um and exactly what athena is talking about um the there was labor activism and, and environmental activism but what's actually been going on is record cargo i mean things are in flux all the time, whether the East Coast is, you know, stealing the West Coast uh, cargo or whether, um, you know, Houthi rubbles in the Red Sea are causing rerouting or a stuck boat in the Suez Canal or whatever there's, or the Panama Canal is, is dried out, whatever, uh, you know, where there's anxiety about where cargo flux is going to land. Um, but basically these, these stories are very, very connected uh, because the coast is, I mean, first of all, they're kind of invisibilized stories about Southern California, just to begin with, both of them. Um, even, you know, this is not the public image of Los Angeles. There's a lot of myth making about LA, but this is not usually part of it. Um, but second of all, as coastal real estate is perceived as more valuable, you know, the reason Inland Empire is on the other side of LA is because LA is there and there's plenty of distribution, uh, you know, and, and industrial areas in LA too, but basically the quote hinterlands, um, are a place to, to push goods to without having to pay coastal real estate prices to build warehouses. Um, and, and so that's a way that they're related. Um, they're also related, and I actually didn't know this about that aspect of your campaign, Athena, until right now, um, in being post-military uses of land here. Uh, because similarly, like the Port of Long Beach used to be a home to a large naval station that departed in the 1990s when the naval activities in Southern California basically consolidated in San Diego County. Um, and yeah, that's a sort of end of, of post-war, uh, or excuse me, end of Cold War uh, economic move where the region leans even harder into distribution and, and logistics and, and shipping. Um, of course, this area has been strategically useful for the U.S. military for, you know, well over a century, uh, but there was a, a lot of active militarized space uh, that's now being decommissioned and and turned to other uses. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say that connects these is the recency of, of both of them, even though the, the coastal development uh, of, of shipping is, and the railroads, you know, it's a it's hundred years and change old, um, but compared to other sites in the United States or port cities around the world, some of them that are, you know, have been shipping hubs since antiquity. This was just plopped down very, very recently uh, by regional managers who decided that they needed a, a port somewhere in Southern California. And, you know, L Los Angeles, Long Beach became it. But something that really strikes me, having myself lived on, you know, mostly the kinds of places that it sounds like you're getting flooded in, Matt, these days, um, is the industrial growth and then even some like post-industrial decline in California is all just so much newer. And so the the building up of this huge, huge space and this, you know, very obdurate set of commitments with, you know, inestimable ta uh, tons of concrete and stuff poured into this infrastructure, it's all really new. Uh, and for me as a STS scholar, it's, it's worth thinking, you know, uh, things could be otherwise and things have been otherwise fairly recently actually in the scheme of things. So, you know, what could be next? And I, that animates me uh, thinking about supply chain 
uh, supply chain problems and supply chain justice and solutions. Yeah, the um, yeah, the the sort of yeah, the the historical newness, the the constant and increasing rate of change in these kinds of sites, sites like the ports. You know, thinking about that inland port idea. I mean, you know, this map, Athena. Uh, that you're that you're using is is so evocative to see that kind of like spread, you know, farther and farther inland as those, you know, warehouse sites pop up. And as Christina points out, you know, there are good reasons to get stuff away from the port as quickly as possible in terms of the logistics industry, because that real estate is more expensive. Um, I guess presumably it is under you know, a more heightened scrutiny in terms of its environmental impact and, you know, the um, the newness of its history, notwithstanding, it is older than the sort of edge of the spread, right? So the, you know, the years of scrutiny, uh, complaints, et cetera, have built up in ways that might be more challenging for uh, new warehouse developments, right? Where people are, you know, uh, forced to confront these things happening in kind of rapid uh, pace, um, and build up a kind of uh, organizing effort and think, you know, and um, uh, bring attention to that site. So uh, my question is about the inland portness, you know, uh, when does this, when does this sort of stop? I guess another good reason to worry about this is the things like flooding, right? Is the, you know, uh, climate change and as ports become maybe more unstable kind of infrastructural objects, then it makes a lot of sense for infrastructure to increasingly move inland. But I feel like that must be challenging, uh, again, because we have to then start thinking about new sites and gathering new information and organizing new groups of people. Um, so, you know, Susan uh, Zeger in the chat asked a question about, you know, the big question, which we'll save to the end, Susan, you know, uh, supply chain justice, you know, what does it look like? But, you know, how does how does the inland port idea, the sort of move away from the port as the thing on the water to a site that could be anywhere, you know, in a, in in the United States context in the country. Right. In fact, ideally, the cheapest possible place in the country that has, you know, logistical infrastructure, um, because, of course, in logistical systems, uh, the more planning and prediction you can do, it doesn't necessarily matter where the thing is, right? Um, as long as it's the cheapest place to store it and you store it for the least amount of time. So how does the idea of these things moving inland complicate, you know, organizing efforts? How do they complicate, you know, uh, you know, from your perspective, Christina, as an STS scholar, you know, thinking about these sites as they're emerging maybe more continuously with less history than they might have had in the past. Um, what is that what does that future look like? The future of the inland port in the perfect logistical location in the middle of the United States, maybe, outside of California, uh, the whole country and inland empire. Again, that was too many questions. I'm sorry. Um, they're not really questions. It's just, you know, it's kind of like thoughts, my thoughts. Well, I don't have an answer. I mean, it's a horrifying thought. So I'm just sitting here with my horror. Um, but, you know, one of, one of the, one of the things to really think about is what these run on, which is energy, you know, and, and the energy regimes that you know underwrite all of this um and you know what i was thinking about when you were talking about like how far can you push the inland port i mean there are lots of answers but like the fuel like the ports in southern california are logistically important for fueling california and goods movement in california and a tour i went on of of the port of Long Beach, uh, the tour operator said, I think that if the ports shut down, Southern California would run out of fuel in five days. And again, we think of, you know, freeways out here as, you know, you're stuck in your passenger car in a traffic jam or something, but there's really truck movement and, and airplane movement. Uh, again, you might think of LAX as a 
hub of passenger traffic, which it is, but again, it's fueling, um, you know, the, the petroleum here is fueling goods movement. Like that really cannot be overstated. So of course, I mean, obviously there's oil on the other side of the Rockies too, but there's a barrier to, of, of the mountain range and, and pipelines don't go across it. So if you're getting, if you're running your inland port on oil and it's coming from Southern California, uh, you know, on the other side, going further inland, you would have, I don't know, tar sands oil or I don't know, oil coming or up from the Gulf coast or something. Um, but of course, and this is again, what, what Athena's engaged in working on, you know, we're seeing a really big push for electrification. Um, and as I understand it, which is, you know, not that, not that thoroughly, but there's, um, you know, very interesting things going on actually in the U S West with talking about using like public lands for solar power and such. And so the, transformation of, of energy uh, for goods movement, I think is, I don't have an answer, but is, is a very important thing to be tracing as you're thinking about like where these things could be cited. Uh, because of course the, the dream is, uh, you know, goods movement without cost. And that's what we're getting, you know, the port PR is bombarding us with those images. There's always costs and, you know, we would ask, to whom, who, you know, qui bono, who, who, who benefits, who, who's bearing a cost. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm starting to sort of ramble incoherently. So I'll hand it off to someone else. Uh, but like, I really think that, you know, the idea is, is limitless movement and yet these places are all tied to material, uh, and material limits and labor and, and all these things. So, yeah, um, everywhere a port, everywhere a uh, port running on electricity instead of gas. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Athena, do you do you have anything you want to add? I can I can reframe some of this a little bit, maybe, um, if if that's helpful. I I think you know just to just to emphasize the the energy connection, you know, part of this. I think is is yeah, you're you know hugely valuable to think about that. Uh, symbiotic, I guess, is the word I use, relationship between, uh, you know, the production of oil and then the goods and the movement of oil as good that also fuels the goods. And, you know, that relationship between energy cultures and uh, logistical infrastructure is obviously, you know, on the East Coast, you know, the history of coal mining and, you know, uh, all of that in terms of uh, East Coast waterways and railroads is is all right there. So I think that's a really important relationship to to underline. I guess thinking about you know the Susan's question of supply chain justice and working our way towards that. Um, the the sort of perspective of consumers, right? I guess is maybe something that I want to or, or not consumers. Consumers consumers such a bad identity to have to occupy. But uh, of people who are not in logistics, let's say, they're not workers in the logistics industry. Uh, and so they come to these problems with a certain kind of awareness. You know, those marketing images from the uh, the port, uh, you know, might be quite compelling, right? It might it'd be all they need really to feel like things are okay to see, you know, uh, a nice little, little, little green park appear all of a sudden and a nice little marketing image say, oh, look, logistics is green now, it's all electric, there's no oil anymore. You know, of course, you know, uh, Athena thinking about, you know, warehouses, the, you know, neighborhoods, uh, communities that are, you know, around those warehouses. There's, you know, not all trucks, certainly most trucks are electric trucks at this point. And even if they are, where's that electricity coming from is, you know, always going to be a complicated proposition. But how do... How do average people um, process this problem? How do you want them to process this problem? How do you want them to understand the, you know, the the movement of the port inland, the movement of goods, the building of warehouses, the kind of environmental overflows of these sites? Um, you know, is it important to 
you know, sort of reach a, again, general public, maybe consumer, but that's, again, a, a sort of problematic identity? Um, or is this something where we should be focused more on labor, more on legislation in terms of getting to the stakeholders of our justice question? I'm going to try to draw some connections between this new question and some of the things you had raised before, um, because thinking about going back to that very scary concept, the whole country is an inland empire. <laughs> um, the, the question of logistics sprawl really comes up a lot with um, electrification, because for one, you had the Inland Empire being marketed to real estate developers and logistics operators as um, cheap land and cheap dirt is uh, what economic boosters in this region were saying, you know, around the early 2000s. But of course, once you've invested in the land, you're trying to push up the value, right? So then it becomes more and more expensive. And um, with electrification, you see these multinational industrial real estate developers seizing on that as a way to drive up their investments, the value of their investments further. So like you have Prologis, it's the largest um, industrial real estate developer in the world, saw a presentation they did where they proudly shared how many percent of goods in the world pass through Prologis own warehouses. I can't remember the exact figure though. Um, and they've seen logistics electrification as an opportunity to get in there and vertically integrate tra electric transportation as part of their offering. So it's like, let's say you run your operation out of a Prologis own warehouse. Now you can also contact them to electrify your trucking fleet. Um, they'll get all the charging infrastructure installed. They'll communicate with the electric utility about upgrading you know, the nearest substation. They'll come in with a plan to install solar panels on your roof so you can offset some of that um, energy use because it, it's massive. The energy use of charging electric trucks is massive. Um, it's like charging one truck. It's like the power of a shopping center. So <laughs> um, solar, they told us directly like, oh, solar panels on a warehouse, those will charge like two trucks. You know, that's not a way of offsetting. <laughs> it's not a way of offsetting that load. Um, and then I also think of how I'm on a lot of these um, policy and regulatory conversations about electrification. And I remember being on one about the, the timeline that's been imposed here in California. Um, it's currently on hold, but drayage operators were facing the prospect of having to electrify their um, heavy duty trucks uh, sooner than any other trucking operators. And I was on a webinar with the Air Resources Board where these people said, well, we run a drayage operation out of Fresno through the port of Oakland. Um, it's not fair that we have to electrify since we're 400 miles from the port. And I'm kind of thinking, well, why are you running a drayage operation 400 miles inland from the port? You know, that, like, that's kind of the real question. Um, and... But with electrification, you do see like startup developers coming in to grab land in places like Bakersfield and Fresno to develop electric truck charging depots for those operators inland. So just a lot of thoughts about um, pushing up the value of land in California and the kind of gentrification that logistics is creating. And, you know, I mean, going back to the consumer question, and then people feel that because 
um, not only are industrial real estate developments actually um, replacing housing that's happened here in um, Bloomington and San Bernardino County, um, but driving up the cost of housing. I can I can always talk, Christina. But uh, do you want to do you want to add? I just had actually a little question that came up. Uh, Athena and I pre-gamed a little bit the other day, um, and so my my book takes um, it, it takes a twenty nineteen proposal by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to do some restoration in San Pedro Bay, which is the bay that holds the the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. Um, as a kind of prompt to visit, revisit some of the decisions about uh, development here. Um, but it also is looking at like approximately 1970 is a big year in my story because it's both uh, when it gets even bigger after um, basically NAFTA, but uh, it's it's when containerized trade starts, uh, you know, really becoming um, a big going concern uh, and, and sort of transiting shipping containers or transiting the globe. But it's also when the United States introduces a bunch of regulation and legislation uh, regarding uh, managing the environment. Uh, and so you have like the National Endangered Species Protection uh, Act and, and other um, the creation of the EPA, uh, the Clean Air and Water Act, these kinds of things. And so uh, part of what was interesting, by which I mean depressing, in this 2019 proposal is they did this uh, very classic move of pre presenting a wide menu of choices, but then really it was narrowed down to a couple that were kind of a foregone conclusion. They were what the federal government was willing to pay for, and they started from the premise that none of the uh, commercial shipping or military operations that happen in San Pedro Bay were going to be affected at all by any wildlife habitat restoration that they might do. Um, and so part of why I was looking at um, various, you know, wildlife protection schemes and stuff was to see the kind of interplay uh, between this shipping and energy regime on the one hand and this environmental regulation on the other. All of that is to say, Athena and I started to talk about, but actually I didn't get a chance to hear about how that uh, is is playing, those kinds of conservation or environmental protection issues are playing in the Inland Empire. Because part of what's going on with the ports on the coast is this is identified supposedly as like a very, very important biodiversity corridor, like one of the more uh, important places on earth for uh, migratory species that are both in the water and sort of flying along, like birds flying along the coast for, all the way from like Patagonia to Alaska. Um, and I know that in, you know, it, it, these stories are all local uh, in that like how a uh, quote endangered species gets brought to bear to, you know, represent uh, various interests or you know, gets mobilized. I'm thinking of like the Delta smelt in uh, the San Joaquin Valley, um, you know, being this flashpoint uh, of fighting over water use and, and you know, agriculture versus um, residents and all these things. So I was actually curious to hear from Athena about uh, what kinds of biodiversity and conservation um, issues you're seeing in the Inland Empire and also what kinds of I don't know, bedfellows or something, those conversations are are making uh amongst, you know, various players. So yeah, this this definitely isn't my area of expertise, but um in the environmental review process for warehouses, you know, they they also need to assess um like fish, game, and wildlife need to come in and assess if there are any risks to endangered species. And I know with one particularly big project um, in Ontario, named after the Canadian province, um, very confusing, um, but it's here in Southern California. And 
Um, I know that some groups that come in to say, to try to use like, oh, this is the habitat of the burrowing owl and the desert tortoise, and also um, a protected Joshua tree habitat, and bring in those conservation arguments, um, which are very real, but also I think part of a like, let's throw everything on the wall and try to get something to stick strategy. Um, I, I guess as far as natural resources more broadly go, though, I think about um, in North San Bernardino County, there is another um, decommissioned Air Force Base, George Air Force Base. And this is where there's some really distant strands, but part of George Air Force Base was developed into um, the Adelanto Geo Immigrant Detention Facility. And then it stretches outward and includes um, the Southern California Logistics Airport. And um, my coworker who lives up there was just taking us on a tour the other day. It was all very striking because you have these two sites and um, then you still just have the ruins of the old Air Force Base. All the housing is still there, um, just condemned, empty, full of graffiti. And um, groups in that region have been elevating the issue of water toxicity there um, because the water that that um, incarcerated people at the geo facility consume, it's toxic from the Air Force Base land use. Um, so all these, and then, um, and then you have the logistics airport there, right? And um, it's like the way, part of the way the site was, you know, not remediated was to give it this other industrial purpose um, that I don't know how much air cargo contributes to exacerbating existing water pollution issues, but there's just a lot of um, intersections around land use and, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christina, do you want to say anything else before I? Okay. No, I, I was just really going to say thank you for that. Um, something else that is was a bit surprising to me moving to California is California has this great reputation for environmentalism. And then the practice, you know, actual land use and actual, you know, um, it, it's it's all it's all basically to make industry run or other um concerns like prisons um that you know there there's so much uh it, it's it's really shocking like the sort of disconnect there not to people who live with it every day but if you're not in california you might not realize what a just overwhelmingly you know toxic state of affairs uh a, a lot of the land and the water uh are are in so anyway that was all i was going to say thank you yeah, to um, um... But, oh, can I add something to that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would throw in there. I was reviewing um some of Christina's book and in her introduction she said something like um what if global systems were set up to generate life, not capital? And I mean, that's kind of what everyone is getting at here, you know, because logistics has been felt so much as the attenuation of life, like the wearing down of land, wearing down of workers and their bodies. Um, and part of that has been to try to use discourses around electrification to reinsert life and all sorts of senses like cleaner air on one hand, but also like better jobs. Um, just the capacity, increasing people's capacity to thrive. Um, and then using that as like a springboard for all sorts of other conversations that extend further down the supply chain, like 
hey, where's the lithium gonna come from to um, power all these trucks? Yeah, um, the uh, I want to I want to orient us towards that question of supply chain justice um, because I think you know the, that that part of the the book where yeah how could we imagine you know supply chains or the infrastructure behind them working differently to you know produce different things is I guess getting back to that you know the the question I had about the sort of general public is more about that um, sort of image that's put out by the logistics industry, by the infrastructure, that image of electrified, you know, systems. So it's clean and great. You know, we had um, Jess Beer uh, not so long ago talking about, you know, the port of Rotterdam and, you know, the marketing there is very much, this is a high tech port. Everything's great. It's so high tech. And of course, most of that is for their clients, right? It's for people who are going to, you know, be moving goods through the port. But it also produces this kind of general public sense of this thing is here. I guess it's good or getting better. And it forecloses all kinds of questions we might ask about should this thing have ever been here at all? Um, should we be doing things in this way at all, right? You know, the sort of deeper logistical questions become options that, you know, as as you said, Christina, and as you, you know, have in your book, they're just not even really presented, right? Of course, we wouldn't do that, right? Here are the, you know, of course, animals would never live over here. So let's talk about where they might live over here, right? You know, it's it's all these options that are removed from the table before the table even comes, you know, and we see it and, oh, we're missing all these things. So that question of logistical justice you know, what does logistical justice look like for you? You know, how can we imagine different logistical futures? Um, I mean, it, it's, you know, the the sort of point of the series, I guess, but it is a big question. You know, there's no um, sort of, I guess, easy answer. Otherwise, we'd just be doing it, right? You know, we um, it's a lot of, you know, small steps and hard steps and, you know, hard thinking about it. But um, yeah, what, what do both of you think about you know, the question of supply chain justice, who who is included in supply chain justice? I know in uh, in your book, Christina, you talk about trans species, you know, uh, supply chain justice, which I think is, you know, a super interesting framing, you know, to include, you know, non-humans, animals, to include the sort of environmental impacts on, you know, uh, plants and um, even, you know, even the sort of geological impact of these things, right, uh, we could uh, start to think about. So, yeah. I don't know who's next. I mean, yeah, um, I'm trying to figure out if I can tie multiple threads together. Probably not, I don't know, I can try. Um, yeah, so the supply chain I think is a really interesting essentially unit for analysis because it's so big and so small at the same time, or it can be very small. It connects things. Um, and I'm hoping to go to the Miriam Posner talk in a week or two that you reminded us of. Um, you know, I, I think my answer, and I want to hear from Athena too, uh, so much because, I mean, I think the work you're doing is part of my answer, um, is really about community self-determination and community sovereignty that then in an ideal world, not the one we live in, but you know, those things connect and they connect and they, they build and they build. Uh, and, and so even, you know, thinking with trans species is including humans and non-humans, but, you know, having, having decisions come down to uh, you know, empowered residents, whoever they are, you know, and whatever their phylum or whatever. Um, of course, it's not to say that that's, you know, that even that does not like simply tie it up uh, because there are conflicts and conflicts of interest and, you know, winners and losers and things. But for me, that's a way of thinking 
you know, across space and and time and and sort of units of organization and forms of life. Um, but I also wanted to sort of ping back to what Athena was talking about. Um, I really liked what you said about logistics. I'm not going to be able to paraphrase it as elegantly as whatever you said, but the you know logistics being annihilating. Uh, but, you know, what if they didn't have to be? Um, and yeah, something, I don't think this would be a revelatory concern, but it's given the audience and the interlocutors, but like, you know, that we're just sort of substituting one unsustainable and unjust, you know, regime for another with electrification. I mean, I think it's so interesting, you know, if the 20th century was some kind of like petrochemical modernism or, you know, better living through chemistry and also really cheap energy and, and all this such, all the stuff, you know, if, if, you know, what does it mean to be substituting in electricity and sort of how far can we push to that as, you know, people imagining as, again, I share your hesitation about the consumer subjectivity, but, um, and, and as also, you know, people, um, you know, working in our communities, like, because of course there are problems with extraction and with um, pollution of all, of all kinds. And, you know, electric vehicles are really heavy. They are sending toxic tire particulates out into local air and into waterways uh, and, and all this stuff. Um, but something Athena and I had been talking about is like, does electrification animate or vivify like some other ideas about what life is that is different than a petrochemical energy? I mean, so going farther than just like eco-modernism or something, but is there like an electrical vitalis vitalism or something that is different than the infrastructure that we're living with now or maybe seeing change? Um, in other words, you know, being appropriately skeptical and critical of like this being a frictionless transition, uh, you know, what is it that is captivating about uh, an electrical a tra a transition uh, to to electrical power? Like, I'm I'm starting to like lose my thread, but like, is there something about that form of energy that is um, worth? zeroing in on either to sort of celebrate or to be sort of extra wary of, I don't know. I think, I think it's really interesting the way that you were um, bringing it up, Athena, as, as doing all this work to construct, you know, better jobs, better air, all these things. Like that's a lot to, to place on an energy regime. And so, you know, what are the real possibilities there? What are the pitfalls, I guess? Yeah, that question actually brings us back to labor in a pretty concrete way, because I think from the perspective of my project, Plug in IE, one thing we've seen is that, I mean, we were envisioned by the, the folks that established the project who preceded me um, as something that could train workers to not be left behind with the electrical transition. So that, for example, diesel mechanics could be upscaled to work on electric trucks. And that turned out to be much more complicated than it seemed. But one thing we did land on was that you have a strong electrical workers union. So can you if those electrician jobs are going to be more in demand, can you um, make them more accessible to people who have conventionally been crowded out, is a term I saw recently, crowded out of the building trades unions? Um, so just from the really literal perspective of labor, um, electrification has created the promise of um, 
just higher quality work that people can be moved into from these um, what's called low road, um, like low quality warehouse jobs. Um, and, and then also I think one thing that is really interesting to me is that electric trucks are both like a real and discursive object because when you talk about electric trucks, like let's say environmental justice organizers, they're actually talking about policy and public incentives and stuff to make these trucks available to fleet operators. But they're also kind of just talking about a relation between people and the land and just like that economic relation which I think goes back to the idea of the consumer because like I'm not into this whole idea of like the, ind the, con the individual consumer's responsibility, you know, in terms of like making consumer choices. But I do think that on some level, individual consumers um, have the always have this possibility open to them to challenge commodity fetishism at the most basic level by seeing products as relations, right? And like the most basic Marxist sense <laughs> and not just like fetishes. Um, so I think the electric truck as a discursive object kind of like brings up some of that, if that was clear at all. Yeah, that was great. Um, so uh, looking looking at the time, I just want to open it up if anybody has any questions. Would anyone like to ask a question to either uh, Christina or Athena or both? I see a lot of claps. I see a lot of virtual clapping hands floating up. Um, do you, you both see that? You see these little floating? Okay. It's, I'm not just, uh, imagining these, uh, these clapping hands. Um, I was very was confused. I've never seen that before. <laughs> oh yes. It's, uh, it's an exciting, a brave new world here. Yeah. Our, our digital electrified future, um, that we're, that we're in. Um, but, um, before we, before we wrap up then, do you, do either of you have any sort of final thoughts that you'd like to offer? I'm so captivated with uh, the electric truck uh, as literal and discursive object that I am incapable of of adding anything of my own. I really like that so much. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, for a variety of reasons, have been um, unsure of exactly where I'm going with research now that this book is done, and but this conversation has been really I, I'm still in this realm, uh, even if objects are not fully in focus for a variety of reasons. Um, and this has been really delightful to to hear your thoughts and framings, both of you. So, but I'm happy to have questions about the Salton Sea or something else. This is your your last chance for questions. Athena, do you have any uh, final thoughts? I guess the yeah, the electric truck, which yeah, is instantly I see the the paper slash book title because that's how I think. But um, it said yeah, it's such a great, interesting thought. Um, uh, and I love discursive objects. So, Homest among us does not love a discursive object. <laughs> All right. Well. Um... If you if no one else has anything to add, then I guess I will uh, officially I'm slowly officially concluding. Um, so thank you uh, so much, um, everyone, for coming. Just as a reminder, uh, our next event is Monday, March 18th at 6 p.m., uh, where we have Miriam Posner from uh, UCLA, uh, who's going to talk about 
Um, some things, you know, seeing the supply chain, uh, SAP, logistical systems, all the stuff that uh, Miriam works on, if you're familiar with her with her work. Uh, so that should be an exciting event, and we hope uh, to see some of you there. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists, uh, who I'll give a real uh, physical clap, but I appreciate all the uh, virtual claps there, uh, to hang around for just one second. Um, and everyone else, uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, hope to see you next time. Uh,